عن أبي هريرة عبد الرحمن بن صخر رضي الله عنه قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول ما نهيتكم عنه فاجتنبوه وما أمرتكم به فأتوا منه ما استطعتم فإنما أهلك الذين من قبلكم كسرة مسائلهم واختلافهم على أنبيائهم إن شاء الله today we'll go over hadith number 9 of the 40 and the Hoya, the 40 hadith of the Nahmanawi, which are actually 42. So, the ninth hadith of the Al-Bahim al the 40 hadith of the Nahmanawi, is a hadith that is reported by Bukhari and Muslim from Abdul Rahman ibn Saq. Who's Abdul Rahman ibn Saq? Abu Hurayr. You're answering? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, this is a hadith that's reported by Bukhari and Muslim, like I said, from Abu Rahman ibn Saf, but this Abu Hurairah, but this wording is Muslim's wording, not a Bukhari's wording. So, in, in this uh, particular wording by Muslim, the Prophet said, وَمَا أَمَرْتُكُمْ بِهِ فَأْتُوا مِنْهُ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ فَإِنَّمَا أَهْلَكَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ كَثْرَةُ مَسَائِلِهِمْ وَاخْتِلَافُهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنْبِيَائِهِمْ مَا نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْ شَيْءٍ أو مَا نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْهُ In some other reports say مَا نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْهُ فَاجْتَنِبُوا مَا نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْهُ فَاجْتَنِبُوا Whenever I forbid you from something, refrain from it completely. Fajtanibu means what? It's like with khamr, when Allah says fajtanibu. Fajtanibu means refrain from it completely. Whenever I forbid you from something, refrain from it completely. Ma nahaytukum anhu, fajtanibu. Wa ma amartukum bihi, fa'tu minhu ma statatum. And whenever I command you, enjoin something on you or command you to do something, do of it as much as you can. Do of it as much as you can. وَمَا أَمَرْتُكُمْ بِهِ فَأْتُوا مِنْهُ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ And whenever I command you to do something, do of it as much as you can. Then the Prophet said, فَإِنَّمَا أَهْلَكَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ For what, is, what, ha, what, what had destroyed the people before you, that's the people of the book before us, what, have, what destroyed them, كَثْرَةُ مَسَائِلِهِمْ Their excessive questioning, or their excessive questions, وَاخْتِلَافُهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنْبِيَائِهِمْ And their disagreement with or over their prophets. They're differing with their prophets. So, certainly this hadith has many lessons. If we start by the beginning of the hadith, مَا نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْهُ فَاجْتَنِبُوا Whenever I forbid you from something, refrain from it. وَمَا أَمَرْتُكُمْ بِهِ فَأْتُوا مِنْهُ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ And whenever I command you to do something, do of it as much as you could. That particular part we will address first, and then we will address the, the, the part about uh, the frequent questions or the excessive questions. So when the Prophet ﷺ says this, what is the what is the lesson from from this statement that a refraining from the prohibitions takes precedence over uh, good actions over performance of good deeds mm -hmm. so refraining from bad deeds or evil deeds takes precedence over performance of good deeds and you will find a lot to support this You'll find a lot to support this. The Prophet ﷺ said, as Abu Huraira reports from him, اتقي اتقي الله تكون أعبد الناس. اتقي 
تكون أعبد الناس fear from the transgressing the bounds of Allah the, the, the violating the sanctity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala maharim Allah is that which he prohibited those are the bounds of Allah أَلَا إِنَّ لِكُلِّ مَلِكٍ حِمَى حديث النعمان بن بشير أَلَا إِنَّ حِمَى اللَّهِ مَحَارِمُ Most verily for every king there is a sanctuary and Allah's sanctuary is what he prohibited, his prohibitions so اِتَّقِ مَحَارِمَ اللَّهِ تَكُنْ أَعْبَدَ النَّاسِ Stay away from maharim Allah from that which Allah prohibited you become the best of worshippers تَكُنْ أَعْبَدَ النَّاسِ you become the best of worshippers this was confirmed by statements from the Sahaba many of the Sahaba corroborated this meaning Umar radiallahu anhu said لا أن أرد ذانقا من حرام خير لي من أن أتصدق بمئة ألف ذانق لا أن أرد ذانقا من حرام for me to return one you know ذانق is, is a currency is a type of currency one ذانق earned from haram that is haram when they have to return it is better than to donate to give in charity 100,000 dhanaks it is better than to give in charity 100,000 dhanaks why? because people oftentimes oftentimes they do good deeds for basically spiritual elevation for their own spiritual well-being they feel that it is good to do good deeds but it is not out of observance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and out of the pursuit of his pleasure subhanahu wa ta'ala that is why good deeds are common property you know between those that are you know sincere to Allah and those that are not sincere to Allah atheists do good deeds that is why some of the righteous predecessors used to say Al-Birru Al-Birru Lil-Barri Wal-Fajr Walakin la yattaqil maharim illa siddiq So acts of goodness are done by the good doers and the wicked ones Acts of goodness are done by anyone Whether they are sincere or not Whether they are observing Allah or not Sometimes they may not even believe in Allah but they do those acts of goodness out of moral elevation, out of self-respect, uh, out of uh, various reasons. And it is also easy to do good deeds. It's easier to do good deeds than it is to refrain from the prohibitions. Prohibitions. The, the, you know, greed for money, the lust and so on. To refrain from those prohibitions is more difficult than to, to do good deeds. So good, good deeds are common property. Everybody does good deeds. But to stay away from the maharim of Allah, not, no one does this with excellence except the Sadiq, he used to say. Like, لا تقي maharim Allah إلا Sadiq. No one does this with excellence, staying away from maharim of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except a Sadiq. So it is not about you know, making Umrah every other year and fasting Mondays and Thursdays. In fact, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, see, that, that was the statement of Umar ibn Khattab that we just mentioned about returning one dana from Haram being better than 100,000 in, in, in charity. So, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz said, لَيْسَ تِتَّقْوَى بِكَثْرَةِ الصَّلَاةِ وَالصِّيَامُ وَالتَّخْلِيْتِ بَيْنَ ذَلِكْ وَلَكِنَّ التَّقْوَى أَن تُقَابِلَ الْأَمْرَ بِالْإِتِمَارِ وَالنَّهِيَ بِالْإِنْسِجَارِ أَوْ كَمَا قَالْ So, Umar Rabbil Aziz said, Taqwa is not about, you know, much fasting and much prayers and mixing between the two. Like, you know, it, it is about meeting every command from Allah with compliance and meeting every prohibition with abstention and meeting every prohibition with abstention. So that is Taqwa. Taqwa is to observe Allah in everything that you do. It is not about selecting what you like to do, because some people select, you know, are selective. So they, they, they completely give a blind eye to so many commands and prohibitions. That is not submission. Submission is to do as he likes, not as you like. Not because you like to fast Mondays and Thursdays and feel it's healthy and feel, you know, it's, it's 
you know, makes you lose weight or something. Not because you feel good about going to Umrah and coming back, trip and you know, change you know, places and environment and you go there and come back and you feel a little bit good, but, uh, but you, you didn't change any. You do the same wrong things that you used to do before you went to Umrah. You used to do the same bad deeds that you used to do before you went to Hajj. You did not change any. It is not about your choosing. It's not about your preference. It's not about your taste. It is about Allah's choosing for you. So compliance is to comply with everything. Once you be you've become selective, then you're worshiping your own vanity and desire and your own you know, uh, liking and choosing. You're not worshiping Allah. Because worshiping it in totality, in entirety. That's why he said, Ya ayyuhaladheena amanu, edukhulu fi silmika. For all you who believed, enter into Islam with your entirety and in its entirety. With your entirety, your heart, your mind, your body, completely conform to Islam with your entirety and it khuluf is sin in its entirety, in Islam, in its entirety, the entirety of Islam, not your preference of, uh, of Islam, of you know, the teachings of Islam. Whatever Allah commanded you, you take it all. So now, the Prophet stressed the refraining from the prohibitions because it is harder on people to refrain from prohibitions. It is harder on people to refrain from prohibitions. But some scholars said quite the opposite. He said that the Prophet ﷺ said, stay away from prohibitions because that requires inaction. Mm -hmm. And whenever I command you to do something, do of it as much as you could because that, is, that requires action. And for inaction, you don't need any prerequisites. You don't need any ability, power, energy. Do you need energy for inaction? No, you need energy for action. And you don't, so you don't need power, energy, tools, means, capacity to stay away from the prohibitions of Allah. But you do need all of the above for actions. That is why Hajj is for one who affords the means. That's why Salam is for the capable. Mm -hmm. That is why Salah, Hadith Imran ibn Hussain, he, the Prophet وسلم, said to him, Salli qa'iman fa in lam stata fa qa'idan fa in lam tastata fa ala jam. Pray standing, and if you can't, pray sitting, and if you can't, pray laying down. Hadith Imran ibn Hussain. So action requires that energy. So that's why the Prophet وسلم, said, do of those actions as much as you can. There is no conflict between the two meanings. Action requires energy. It is physical power. It is financial means. But to stay away from the maharim requires so much willpower, irada. Willpower, submission, taslim, that is to stay away from the mahar. It does not require much physical or monetary capacity to stay away from the mahar, right? So the actions that require physical and monetary capacity, the Prophet ﷺ told you, do as much as you can. But you have no excuse when you have weak willpower. There is no excuse. It is moral weakness. It is spiritual weakness that you need to elevate, that you need to work on. It is moral and spiritual weakness that you need to elevate. If you find yourself unable or incapable of refraining from the prohibitions, know that this is not about capacity here. Capacity is when you say, well, you know, I come home late and I, you know, once I have dinner and so on, and I sleep, after Aisha for sure, I sleep and I can't pray the night prayers and I work hard during the day. I can't fast Mondays and Thursdays. And, uh, you know, I don't have much savings. I can't give charity. I only give my zakat. 
all of this, yes, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. But you can't say, well, I just can't stop watching pornography. You may think it is hard. It could be harder to, to stop watching pornography than to you know, pray to rakas in the middle of the night or to fast Mondays. A lot of people fast Mondays and Thursdays and watch porn. It is harder, not because it requires much energy capacity, physical or monetary, because you have weak devotion, weak dedication, weak commitment, weak religious commitment. You're not committed. That's why your spiritual uh, meter is, is, is low. You, you can't resist to those acts, uh, you know, the prohibited acts. So, one may say, but which one of the two groups is more beloved to Allah, greater in the sight of Allah, abandoning the prohibitions or performance of actions? Performance of actions. Yes. Because la ilaha illallah is an action. Is there anything greater than that? Prayer is an action. You know, fasting is an action. So the group, that group is more beloved to Allah than abandoning the prohibitions. That group is meant for itself. You know, you pray because that is a direct means to get you closer to Allah. You don't drink because that will cause you harm, that will cause you know societal problems and uh, issues, and that will keep you from the prayer. Oh, you who believe, do not come close to the prayer while you are intoxicated until you can comprehend what you say. So khamr is prohibited because it keeps you from the prayer. Then which one is greater? The performance of prayer or the shunning of khamr. The prayer. performance of prayer is, is, is greater. So that group is greater than the other group. Yet the Prophet ﷺ told us, stay away from the prohibitions, all of it, because inaction does not require physical or monetary capacity. So everybody could do it. Once you have the religious commitment, the willpower, you'll be able to do it. Don't be, you know, uh, don't be uh, weak and don't be too soft with yourself when it comes to the staying from the prohibitions. But when it comes to actions, then there is room for concessions and dispensations. Rukhas. Rukhas. Whenever we can't, then we can't. But does this apply? Does this apply to al faraid or it applies to the actions that are sunan? Sunan. Primarily applies to sunan. Primarily, because but keep in mind that faraid also have you do it if you can. Siyam, you do it if you can. But in general, the fara'id that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made obligatory on us human beings are within the capacity of the vast majority of us. The vast majority of us. So do, it, uh, do of it as much as you can primarily applies to the sunnah. Primarily applies to the sunnah. Because most of the fara'id are within the capacity of most of us. Of most of us. So, مَا نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْهُ فَاجْتَنِبُوهُ وَمَا أَمَرْتُكُمْ بِهِ فَأْتُوا مِنْهُ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ فَأْتُوا مِنْهُ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ فَأْتُوا مِنْهُ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ does not mean that you're, you, you, you be negligent of the, the fara'id for the acts of worship that will draw you closer to Allah. مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ within your capacity. Do you know how much is within your capacity? A lot is within your capacity. There a lot is within your capacity. Look at the people around you. Look at how they wake up in the morning at five o'clock to five o'clock to walk the dog before they go to work. And we sometimes find it hard to wake up for fat, you know. So it is within the capacity of human beings to get themselves out of bed to walk the dog before they go to work. Right? So so there is a lot that is within our capacity if we just Tap into the, the resources that we have as human beings. There is well, the, the willpower, the strengths that we have, psychological strengths that we have as human beings. 
Now let's move to the second half of the hadith, or the second part of hadith, which is فَإِنَّ مَا أَهْلَكَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ كَثْرَةُ مَسَائِرِهِمْ وَاخْتِلَافُهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنْبِيَائِهِمْ For that, for what have destroyed the people before you, is their excessive questions and their disagreement with their prophets, and their disagreement with their prophets. Now, excessive questions. Someone may say that when you ask enough questions, that means that you're dedicated, that you're devoted. It doesn't necessarily mean that. It means that you're asking questions just to ask questions and get answers. The Prophet is pointing out something extremely important here. Because we'll talk about you know which kinds of questions that you should not ask and which kinds of questions that you should ask. But the Prophet, but before this, keep 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 this in mind. The Prophet is pointing out that if you are had you been busy, have you been had you been busy acting upon the previous answers, you would have not had time to ask too many questions. Had you been busy acting upon the previous answers, you would have not had that much time to ask too many questions. So because to ask a question about the night prayers, for instance, and when is the best time for the night prayers and this and this and that. And then you get involved in the night prayers. You ask questions about visiting the sick. You ask questions about, you know, the virtue of washing the dead. You, you ask these questions. If every time you hear an answer, you commit to performance, you commit to action, then you would have not been so, uh, you know, uh, you would not have, have not had that much time uh, to, to go back and ask more questions. And that's what the Sahaba used to do. To the point where Abdullah ibn Abbas, as a Bazaar reported in his Musnad, said, I have not seen anyone better than the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. They only asked him 12 questions, all of them are mentioned in the Book of Allah. These are the questions that are mentioned in the Book of Allah, but he asked him some other questions that were not mentioned in the Book of Allah. But he's pointing out the rarity, uh, the scarcity of the questions that, that they asked the, the, the companions, radiallahu anhu. <laughs> يسألونك عن الخمر والميسر يسألونك عن المحيض يسألونك عن الأهلة All of these are questions that the Sahaba asked that were mentioned in the Quran They ask you about khamr and maisir They ask you about the period of al-mahid they, they ask you, they seek your fatwa concerning women They seek your fatwa concerning al-kalala Which is the, the man who uh, dies without ancestors or descendants these are questions that Allah mentioned in the Quran, but they, they ask other questions as well. They ask him about the umara, the leaders that will come later, and, you know, and what we should do with them if they command us to do, you know, wrong. They ask him about the fitan, Hudayfa used to ask the Prophet sallallahu about the fitan, the trials, the tri tribulations ahead of them. They would ask him when they went on an expedition, they would ask him questions, what should we do here and there. So they ask the Prophet sallallahu alayhi questions. But so which questions they were prevented from asking? They were actually prevented from asking questions. It's in the Quran, in Surah Al-Ma'idah. <laughs> oh, you will believe, do not ask about things that if, were reveal, if they were revealed to you, they would cause you distress and grievance. Don't ask about things that if revealed to you, they will cause you distress and, and grievance. Muslim reported from Anas that he said we were forbidden. Nuhina an an nas ala Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Fakani wajibun an yati al rajul min min al badiya al aqil fayasaluhu wa nasma. We were forbidden from asking the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam questions, and so we used to like uh, when someone came from al badiya, you know, from, from yeah, the, the desert. 
uh, and ask the Prophet some questions, and then we would listen. We would listen it to the point where some, you know, it has been reported that they bribed some man with a garment to go and ask the Prophet <laughs> a question, so that they could listen. Uh, so they, they were forbidden from asking the questions. In Nawas ibn Sam'an, Muslim also reported from Nawas ibn Sam'an that he said, قَدِمْتُ إِلَى الْمَدِينَةَ فَمَكَثْتُ فِيهَا سَنَةً لَا يَمْنَعُنِي مِنَ الْهِجْرَةِ إِلَّا الْمَسْأَلَةِ كَانَ الرَّجُلْ إِذَا هَاجَرَ مُنِعَ مِنَ السُّؤَالِ I came to al Medina and spent one year in Medina, spent one year in Medina, and nothing prevented, nothing prevented me from declaring my hijrah to al Medina except that they wanted to ask more questions because once you had declared that you are that you had made hijrah you were prevented from uh, from asking questions why because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it is as if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them you know so much you have so much you're getting the quran is being revealed unto you the prophet is in your midst there is so much that you can you should act upon you know this is not for intellectual luxury this is not for, you know, like mental gymnastics. This is for action. This, this knowledge should be for action. Go ahead and work. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was telling the Sahaba. But people who came from the outskirts of Medina, people who came from farther away, you know, the various tribes dispersed uh, in Arabia, they came. Then the Prophet ﷺ would entertain their questions. They need to learn. When do, you know, Abdullah bin Rasul said something that is very telling of, of this fact that you're either busy asking questions or you're busy acting upon the answers. You know, busy, uh, you know, acting, uh, working. Uh, so Abdullah bin Rasul said to them, كيف بكم, it was, this was reported by Abdul Razak and his Musannaf, كيف بكم إذا لبستكم فتنة what do you think of yourselves when a fitna, a trial, a severe trial, will envelop you? In which the young will grow old, and the old will become senile. So the tabi'un were sitting around, Abdullah bin Saud is starting to become quite concerned and scared. And he said, when is that? And then he said to them, إذا قل أمناؤكم وكثر أمراؤكم وقل فقهاؤكم وكثر قراؤكم وتفقها لغير الدين وطلبت الدنيا بعمل الآخرة. So he said to them, إذا قل أمناؤكم when those trust when the trustworthy amongst you become few, very few, وكثر أمراؤكم and your leaders become too many. People who are really trustworthy are very few, but the leaders are too many. The people who are endowed with a good understanding of their religion, Faqih is the one who is endowed with a good understanding of their religion, become very few. And your reciters become too many. That is not necessarily the reciters of the Quran, the al Quran. That is basically the people who recite knowledge, people who memorize the Quran and the Sunnah and so on, and they can recite and talk and talk and talk and talk. But fiqh, the, the good understanding of the deen itself, fiqh is the understanding that results in action, that results in obedience, that results in compliance, that results in khashiyah. That's why when they asked Imam Ahmad about Ma'ruf al-Karhi, his knowledge, and he was not of the most knowledgeable of the tabi'een, he said, He had the root of, of all knowledge. Khashiyatullah, the fear of Allah. And when they asked Imam Ahmad, who should we ask about after you? He did not mention any of his famous uh, students. But he mentioned one of his students who was less, or he mentioned one of you know the, the scholars at the time who was much less knowledgeable than the famous ones, Abdullah, Abdul Wahab al Warraq. They, so they asked, they said, you know, he, he doesn't know that much, they told him. He said, He said that he has enough fear of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will make him more deserving 
of guidance, tawfiq, tasdeed, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what Ibn Muhammad said. So, qalla fuqaha'ukum, the, 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 those endowed with the good understanding of the religion become few, wa qal kathara qurra'ukum, and those who are, you know, you know, eloquent preachers, you know, memorizers, knowledgeable, know much about the technicalities and much about, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the difficult questions of, of knowledge, they become many. Then, he said, وَتُفُقِّهَا لِغَيْرِ الدِّينِ And then people seek fiqh for other than the deen. وَطُلِبَتِ الدُّنْيَا بِعَمَلِ الْآخِرَةِ And when the dunya is pursued, pursued or sought by the work of al akhirah by the work of al akhirah And Ali radiallahu anhu had a similar report, but he added in his report, وَتُعُلِّمَ لِغَيْرِ الْعَمَلِ وَتُعُلِّمْ and people learn, but not for action. People, people learn for other than action. So which questions, which mas'ala that they were prohibited from asking? They were prohibited from asking questions that are of no avail, of no benefit, of no benefit. See, the beauty of the Qur'an is that it was not ever involved in frivolous or superfluous details. You know, the, the, the scriptures before, you know, the talk about the, the, the Ark of Noah and what happened, or, you know, and the, the, the animals and what the animals did with each other and the number of nails and the number of wood bugs and all of that stuff. All of that's not mentioned in the Quran. In fact, in the Quran about, the, you know, you read Surah Al-Kahf, you read about the Surah of the Sleepers, it said, سَيَقُولُونَ ثَلَاثَةٌ رَابِعُهُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ وَيَقُولُونَ خَمْسَةٌ سَادِسُهُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ رَجْمًا بِالْغَيْبِ وَيَقُولُونَ سَبْعَةٌ وَثَامِنُهُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ قُلْ رَبِّي أَعْلَمُ بِعِدَّتِهِمْ مَا يَعْلَمُهُمْ إِلَّا قَلِيلٌ فَلَا تُبَارِ فِيهِمْ إِلَّا مِرَاءً ظَاهِرَةً وَلَا تَسْتَفْتِ فِيهِمْ مِنْهُمْ أَحَدًا So they will say, Allah SWT said, they will argue and say, they are three and the fourth is their dog. And some will say they are five and the sixth is their dog. Rajman bin Ghayb, out of conjecture, you know, guessing doubt, 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 uh, doubtfully. Qul Rabbi a'lamu ba'adatihim, say my Lord knows their number best. Did, it, did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell him what the number is? No, Allah didn't say. Because why should you get, wh why don't you learn the moral of the story? And why did you benefit from the lesson? Whether they were our three and the, the dog is their fourth or five and the dog is their sixth or seven and the dog is their eighth, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala overlooks those details, does not mention those details. They teach us. This is not, this is to teach us. So to ask about knowledge that is of no benefit, that is one thing. To ask out of mockery or istihza, or out of ta'annut, which is to give like grief and distress to the one being asked. That is also forbidden. Bukhari reported from Abdullah ibn Abbas, كان الناس يسألون رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم استهزاء فيقول أحدهم من أبي ويقول الآخر أين ناقتي Some some of the people, the hypocrites for sure, he would ask the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم out of sport and mockery. One of them would tell, would tell him, who is my father? And one of them would tell him, uh, where is my camel? So, that, you know, to, to, to cause the Prophet ﷺ distress. And one day, the Prophet ﷺ came out, you know, with a red face and particularly angry from the too many questions. This was reported by Tabari. And then a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and to also further aggravate the Prophet ﷺ, he uh, said to him, Man Abi. So the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Huzafa, which is not his known father. Uh, and it, it, people knew that this man was actually not the son of his claimed father or known father. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in Surah Al Maidah, Ayyuha Ladina Amanu la tasaru ala shia in tubdalakum tasurkum. All you who believe, do not ask about things that if revealed to you, they will cause you grievance and distress. Why are you asking? 
And why do you need to ask you know, frivolous questions? And why do you need to ask questions that may cause you grievance or distress? You should not. So when they ask questions for sport or mockery or to cause distress to the Prophet وسلم, that they were prohibited from this. Also to ask questions about halal and haram, many questions about halal and haram that will cause you know, uh, strictness, that will cause some revelation to, to, to descend that will, will, will that may result in hardship for the believers. The Prophet ﷺ said, as Bukhari Muslim reported this from Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas anhu, that the Prophet ﷺ said, أَعْظَمُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ فِي الْمُسْلِمِينَ جُرْمًا مَنْ سَأَلَ عَنْ شَيْءٍ لَمْ يُحَرَّمْ فَحُرِّمَ مِنْ أَجْلِ مَسْأَلَةِ the, 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 the one who commits the greatest crime uh, against the Muslims uh, is the one who asks about something that was not forbidden, then it becomes forbidden because of his question. Then it becomes forbidden because of, so you're, you're making things tighter, you're more stricter for the Muslim. So don't ask those questions. Don't ask those questions. Because it, it, it is not about, you know, so sometimes people think that the issue of halal and haram is the, you know, their knowledge of the halal and haram and, and, and so on, is the, the, the final, is, is basically the final gauge of piety, which is not true. There is so much haram that, is your, that you're doing with your heart every day from the time you wake up in the morning. There is so much prejudice and pride and arrogance and deceit and conceit and self-conceit inside you that you need to take care of and you're not doing any of this. So why are you asking about the blood of uh, fleas? Like someone came and asked Abdullah ibn Umar, you know, about the blood of fleas and whether it, 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 it is nudges and it violates the, the tahara necessary for the prayer. So Abdullah ibn Umar said to him, where are you from? He said, from Iraq. He said, you guys killed the Hussein and you're coming to ask me about the blood of the fleas. So this tri triviality, there is so much that you have. There are snakes that are eating up your heart inside, and you're completely, uh, you know, clueless about them. You, you, we wake up in the morning and we, and we go to bed at night, and we earn just with the thoughts of our heart. Just when when you come across one of your fellow brothers and you despise them for whichever reason, you know. You're done for the day, right? You could be done completely. You could be done forever. Because the Prophet said, It is enough evil for, any, for, for a man to despise his fellow Muslim. It's enough evil. What does it mean enough? Enough to destroy you. You could be done. So there is so much that you need to work on. It is also not, it is also not good to be asking too many questions uh, to find dispensations, to find ways out because of the lack of commitment and the lack of willpower. And that is why a man came to Abdullah ibn Umar in Hajj. Uh, this, this hadith is reported by Bukhari. So the man came to Abdullah ibn Umar in Hajj and he asked him about the Hajar al Aswad, the black stone. So Abdullah ibn Umar said to him, I saw the Prophet وسلم, Touch the black stone. I saw the Prophet touch it and kiss it. So the man said to him, the man was from Yemen. And so the man said to him, Araita in Wulipt Anhu. Araita in Zuhimt. So what do you think if I if I if I were barred from it? If I well, if it was outcrowded or so what do you think if uh, something happens like this so Abdullah ibn Umar said to him bil Yemen. leave Ara'ayt in Yemen <laughs> Ara'ayt what do you think if what do you think if uh, so leave Ara'ayt in Yemen and then he repeated it Ara'ayt wa Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa wa yuqabbiru I saw the messenger of Allah touch it and kiss it. Now, could, is it possible that you couldn't do it? It is possible. 
However, at the time you receive this information, this knowledge, رأيت رسول الله يستلم ويقبله, you should be, you should be intent on doing this. And don't ask like too many questions. When, when you can't, then you can't. If you can't, then you can't. But at the time you hear this information, your heart should be focused on, I will do as the Prophet ﷺ did. I will follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And then eventually, if you couldn't, then you couldn't. But if you, if you keep on saying, all right, what if, or what happens if the, that, that, that distracts you from the focus. The focus should be to follow the way of the Prophet ﷺ and, and to follow his footsteps. So these are all types of questions that are frivolous or that are harmful, whether because there is no need, whether because they cause you distraction, whether be because they are they cause the person being asked, uh, you know, grief and distress. I forgot to mention that the, the uh, reason this hadith was reported is when a man asked the Prophet ﷺ, when the Prophet ﷺ was talking about Hajj, uh, a man asked the Prophet ﷺ, Afi kulla aam ya Rasulullah, is Hajj obligatory every year, O Messenger of Allah? And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, uh, if I say yes, that it would have become, become mandatory on you, and you would have not been able to perform it. And then in some reports, and if you did not, and if you did not, if you abandon what I command you to do, you will become disbelievers. And so then the Prophet ﷺ said, leave me alone as, as long as I uh, uh, leave you. Uh, so don't ask me su such questions because strictness and you know uh, hardship it is not desired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the believers. So when the believers make it stricter on themselves, that is uh, that is not desired by Allah and that is disliked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Finally, uh, I must say that asking too many questions asking too many questions and being busy with asking those questions creates more questions because the, you're busy with asking the questions you're not in compliance had you been in compliance you would have had less questions had our ummah been in compliance it would have had less questions you know uh, we were just having a meeting at Amja about the fatwa the fatwas online um, so they were uh, you know, sharing with us that now we have 10,000 fatwas on the site. So I, I was saying, why don't we have some students of knowledge uh, actually uh, triage the, the questions, screen the questions, and then direct the people to the existing fatwas. And they said that every, every uh, fatwa is new. It's, it's just like too many new issues, too many. You know? So it, if the ummah was complying with the knowledge that has been transmitted to it, the ummah would have not been making up uh, like lots of stories. If 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 we the, you know if people divorce their wives when they need to divorce their wives when they have to divorce their wives the sunnah way, then we will not have like two hundred thousand questions about the various uh, forms of divorce. I divorced her three times. I divorced her this, I divorced her that, I, you know, and sometimes the people also can become quite creative. I divorced her 10 times minus 7. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, it's frivolity, triviality. And, uh, yeah, if you just want to cause distress to your wife, and then it becomes a question, and then it takes time out of a mufti to sit down and, you know, figure out the math and then figure out the answer. I'm afraid we, we took a little bit it's longer okay. than usual, okay. so I don't know, we'll have to stop. Okay, I'm just going to